Ballarat will be a scout city for the next nine days, a city of woggles, troops, packs and patrols. But it's not about roughing it. The Jamboree has luxuries. Tap water, showers and practically every portable toilet in the country. Sampling the facilities, 300 overseas scouts and thousands of enthusiastic Australians. Four people died on Saturday night when this coach hit a bridge 15 kilometres west of Tamworth. There are predictions this bridge, further along the highway near Gunnedah, could be the scene of more carnage. It carries an average of 3,500 vehicles a day, one-fifth of them trucks. Each one bends the bridge dramatically. Every pile on the bridge has been spliced. Every span on the bridge has had a dummy uh, prop put under it to, to try and reduce the deflections on the, on the bridge, so it's gone well past its life. Gunnedah Shire Council maintains $35,000 needs to be spent immediately on repairs. Council says if the RTA doesn't move quickly, the bridge could be the site of another disaster. This is the, the Oxley Highway, so it's a very heavy, heavily trafficked route. It is the, uh, the coach route between Sydney and Brisbane, so it obviously has that potential and we're concerned about that. There are moves underway to address the problem, but Council believes it will be at least a year until something is done. RTA looked to investigate a number of options. We understand that's now with the manager at Newcastle, for his recommendations, the discussions with Council. What we're concerned about is the time delay in getting those recommendations out, and obviously we'll now have to go through the environmental impact statement process, and it could be another 12 months before we know where we're going. Dozens of police converged on Mawson Street shortly after one o'clock this afternoon questioning householders and passers-by in a bid to identify the assailant who wore a black balaclava during the attack. Detectives are appalled by the severity of the incident. They say the woman was savagely punched about the face and body and is now receiving medical attention. The victim answered a knock at the door and uh, he's forced his way into the door and held her down and seriously assaulted her. This is the second attack on an elderly woman in just over a week. On New Year's Day, a 70-year-old woman was sexually assaulted in her home at Ellamore Vale. Police are still looking for a 24-year-old man who broke into the woman's home on Smith Road and attacked her at about 3am on New Year's morning. Although the attacks took place only a few kilometres apart, police are reluctant to link them to one man. As we don't believe so, though, we don't discount that at all, no. Police will continue to canvass the neighbourhood around Mawson Street and are also questioning taxi drivers in the hope that one may have given the attacker a lift to the address. Police say the man is of heavy build. He was in his 30s and wearing jeans and a black T-shirt. Anyone with information on either attack should contact Walls End Police. Tom Hilston, NBN News. This is the new 120-bed wing of Gosford Hospital. Construction will be completed next month. By late April, the equipment will be unveiled and the first patients will be admitted. The Central Coast Health Service is also expanding Wyong Hospital. An additional 100 beds will be opened in July. Advertisements have appeared in local newspapers for 900 positions. Well, the ones we're trying to attract at this stage are in the hospital assistant area, the trade staff, the nursing staff and the clerical, and historically they are local people. Employment opportunities will also be available for more than 100 medical staff. These positions will be advertised later in the national press. Due to the overspending by the Hunt Area Health Service, a number of employees took voluntary redundancies. But will they be given a priority for some of these jobs? Everyone will be judged on their merit. Uh, there will be no bar to people applying for any of the positions at the hospital. 
The Central Coast Health Service says the additions to Gosford and Wyong hospitals will be completed within budget. Jane Anderson, NBN News. For the past four weeks, the banks of the Williams River near Raymond Terrace have been home for the Italians. Here, the seven males and one female are put through their paces from six in the morning till eight at night. First up, a two-hour fitness session, then it's down to the river for stints of up to four hours straight. Here's where the technique problems are ironed out. These sessions plus theory lectures are repeated in the afternoon. It's hard work, but the visitors welcome the opportunity to train during their off-season. Italy whiskey just six mount, a year six, seven mount. And after for us the training is no ski because it's too cold and for come here is really good. That wasn't Peter's only reason for bringing Italy's best skiers down under. In Italy they're used to uh, four-star hotels or everything. By bringing them to, say, Australia, uh, we're showing them just what, uh, what hard training is all about. Peter has been working on new tricks and a new jumping style. Room for improvement, but once mastered and with the world title scheduled for September this year, Peter believes he can lift the Italian's world ranking from ninth to fifth. The coaching has whet Peter's appetite to return to the competitive circuit. Injuries over recent years have hampered his performance. And with this new sense of enthusiasm, Peter says he's out to recapture the Australian crown he lost last year. Wood chopping is an international sport which originated in Tasmania in the 1870s. Today there are plenty of woodsmen more than willing to keep the sport alive and they provided a thrilling display of precision prowess with razor sharp axes during the culmination of four days of wood chopping at the 21st Fish and Chips Festival. 90 axemen from across the eastern states are competing for prize money totalling $14,000. Crowds in excess of 5,000 have poured into the showground over the week and there's expected to be plenty of excitement this evening when the Axemen battle out the New South Wales Queensland State of Origin Relay Woodchop. Despite the recession, tourism in Narrabri is up. The town relies heavily on interstate visitors stopping en route between Victoria and Queensland. 15,000 visitors registered with the Tourism Information Centre during the past 12 months. Local attractions are pulling the passing motorists. Probably the most popular uh, tourist attraction in the area, of course, is the Mad Capital National Park. Um, there's wonderful camping areas up there and it's a great place for people to take families and have a cheap holiday. So uh, probably that's been the most popular and of course the Australia Telescope now is uh, staffed during the week. They've got a lovely visitor centre out there and there's, there's a tremendous amount of interest in astronomy in, in Australia so it's great. Narrabri Shire Council has been concentrating on tourism promotion over the last year or two and the rewards from taking part in travel shows and being included in the Newell Highway Promotional Group are becoming obvious. Marion McLeod says for businesses hit by the rural recession, tourism has been a godsend. It uh, keeps their businesses viable, particularly with uh, motels and caravan parks and what have you. We've found that the um, the motels and caravan parks in the in the um, in the area have done very well this year because people are looking for a cheaper way of, of um, having a holiday. So we've been very happy with that. Well, it seems strange with the recession on. The
The Port Macquarie GIF was resurrected in 1983 and has slowly regained its prestigious position in professional athletics. However, there was a place for the light-hearted. Once again, an attempt to prove who is the master, man or beast. And on this occasion, Chris Davis just got the nod over a fast-finishing ship of the desert. To the serious business of the 92 gift over 200 metres, and it was a win for the blue singlet. Wright picked up the $1,000 first prize with Dean Nettleton of Victoria in yellow second and Paul McCaffrey in green third. You just had to take one look out the back of the shore break to understand why the surf lifesavers from the North Coast region were having nightmares about attempting a watery assault on the courses set out. But try the boaties did with disastrous results. Crews were literally dumped into the sea, craft turned upside down and gear from the boats were pounded into splinters in the atrocious conditions. The organisers did the only thing possible, move the carnival. And while we are on a wild ride, the Wingham Summertime Rodeo was a record breaking affair. Over 5,000 people jamming the showgrounds to take in the open bull ride with Ross Wicks and Chris Mead tying for first, the saddle bronc ride where John Rodney was successful, the bareback with Scott Burnett, the master of that event, and Katrina Merritt, who rode brilliantly to win the ladies' bracelet. At Urala, the 33rd annual Zone 13 Jamboree has been a resounding success, attracting 240 riders from as far away as Tenerfield in the north to Walker in the south, Inverell and Bandara in the west. Most teams were at full strength except for Ashford, affected badly by the storm last week. And besides the competition which was fierce, all riders are in a position to learn. We provide a lot of uh, instruction and we're providing more and more instruction throughout the state for children and uh, we are an organisation which is improving and getting better and better all the time, I'm sure. And some amazing result. Nine-year-old Kelly Harvey of Armadale was declared the champion girl rider, while seven-year-old Cameron Neville of Inverell was the champion boy rider. The Hunters contingent of Scouts arrived back this morning. Around 650 Scouts and leaders from the area participated in the Jamboree, helping to make up the estimated 15,000 Scouts who joined the tent city at Ballarat. After 10 days away, the Scouts received a warm welcome home. Although they'd been travelling all night, it took more than mere weariness to quell the excitement. It was a real great time and experience of a lifetime. Yeah, you glad you went? Yeah, I'm glad to be home and that. I'm a bit homesick. Did you meet lots of new friends? Yeah, yeah. yeah. heaps of kids from other countries. Mm. Yeah, it's great. It was good, but it was long, tiring, and got a little bit homesick, not much, but... Do you think it's good for these boys and girls to experience something like this? I don't know about them, but it was great for me. Around 30 countries were represented at Ballarat, including the first Russian scouts to attend an overseas jamboree. While officials were defending allegations of wild brawls, theft and even sexual assault this week, according to local leader Neil Gleghorn, the biggest problem they were aware of was homesickness. We had a few problems at the beginning, but uh, we all, all seemed to pull together as a unit and got over it. The next Australian jamboree will be held in Perth in three years' time. Rangers with the Tamworth Rural Lands Protection Board have been waging a constant battle against plague locusts since last September. The latest aerial inspections have found bands of the insects in the Baraba, Manila, Atunga, Tamworth and Gunny Ganu areas. But around Gunnedah, prolific pasture growth is hiding the latest hatchings, causing problems for those trying to contain the bands. We're having a lot of problems finding them here with the prolific growth. Uh, we've got a very wide range in ages of locusts. We've got them from just hatching right through to fledgling and some of them starting to swarm. 
The fear is not that these bands could move south into the Hunter. Rangers in the Scone, Merriwar and Denman Singleton Rural Lands Protection Boards have already reported serious hatchings. The message is to get out there and look. It's, it's, it's not... Uh, you, you won't find the hoppers just uh, on the occasional uh, drive around the property or, or looking at a cow or, or, a, or a, a sick horse or something. You've got to go out and look. And that's what we've been doing this morning. We've been taking grid patterns over areas that we know that they're there. The Australian dollar has been steadily falling for the last month, but last week's 1% drop in interest rates sent the value of the dollar into rapid decline. While it's bad news for Aussie travellers and companies importing into the country, Australian export industries say it's been too long in coming. For farmers trying to sell produce like beef, wool and wheat overseas, a one cent fall in the value of the dollar US is worth around $150 million in income or an extra $1,300 for every farm. Well, it's good for farmers. We're 80% exporters. So a drop in the dollar really puts dollars in the farm gate. Also reaping the benefits is the coal industry, but no one in the industry is prepared to say too much as delicate contract negotiations are underway with the Japanese. However, a spokesperson for Coal and Allied says that for every one cent drop in the dollar, the company makes an extra $6 million a year. BHP Steel too is counting its profits. A one cent fall in the dollar also represents an extra $6 million for the company. Although the market in Australia is deregulated, the Reserve Bank is known to be hard at work preventing the dollar from free-falling. Export industries want the government to let the dollar reach its natural level without intervention. Jodie McKay, NBN News. Kinza has blitzed all comers since arriving down under and bringing his own equipment for the Aussie assault has proved to be the difference in winning and losing. But along the way the American wonder driver has upset the locals, especially the last time here in Newcastle when he was the centre of controversy in the 30 lap feature and a coming together with young hotshot Brooke Tatnell saw the latter's car finishing a ride off and Kinza relegated to the rear of the field. Kinza refused to cop the umpire's decision and retired to the infield but he did get the support of people such as Gary Rush, who believe Kinzer copped a raw deal. In the final showdown tomorrow night, the world champion will be out to consolidate a fine season in Australia, while the Aussies will be hell-bent on sending him stateside licking his wounds. Whichever way, it will be dog-eat-dog -dog at the drum come 8 o'clock. The National Tomato Contest was started in 1980 after some friendly boasting by a Gunnedah man that his tomatoes were the biggest and the best. His mates took up the challenge and the competition was born. Vegetable growers from across the region now make the pilgrimage to Gunnedah each January to put their results to the test. Are they the biggest, the ugliest or even the best looking? While the judges deliberated, it was tomato sandwiches all around. The award for the biggest tomato went to Keith Eldridge, who says it's not really so hard to grow a giant tomato. The secret is, uh, well, an old chap told me actually, out near Lightning Ridge, he uh, buries a couple of catfish either side of his tomato plant when he plants them. I, I always had a laugh at that, but I gave it a go this year and you can see the results there. But one entrant, unhappy with his produce, resorted to ball bearings to make up the weight of the not-so-big red. For the judges, choosing the winning tomatoes has become a fine art. A consistency and, uh, and obviously, if you wanted to put that tomato on your sandwich... So The unit is a $300,000 a year state government initiative. Former Tamworth GP Dr John Trotter this week took up his position as head of the unit while three young doctors are at the hospital under the scheme. Several others associated with the program are currently working in country practices. 
The doctors will work in the practices for about four years and learn all the skills needed to be a general practitioner in a country town. The range of problems that they have to tackle in the country is enormous, as you can imagine. So they'll be concentrating, to start with anyway, on the basic sort of skills like surgery, obstetrics, uh, anaesthetics, uh, accident and emergency. Um, at the same time in the program we hope to, what well, we will incorporate, um, a general rounding of general practice. It's hoped the training unit will overcome the problem of doctor shortages in country New South Wales. We'll be putting about four persons a year into uh, general practice. There are a good number of vacancies in small towns and, and, and at just at the moment in Tamworth, as, as some people would know. Um, and I think we'll fill a lot of those over the next few years. The unit will also provide an extensive support service for the rural GPs once they leave the scheme and start working in country towns to ensure they don't feel isolated from others in the medical profession. Organisers had cut this year's program from three days to two, but now they've had to call off the entire event. We had to, felt we had to cancel. We had a meeting of the club and uh, because of the drought and the shortage of cattle, most of the cattle in the area have been, suitable cattle have been sent south. Uh, any that are here, we felt it would be almost an insult to ask people after having fed them right through uh, and without having a, an early enough break to go and ask them for cattle would have been... Uh, well, impossible. We didn't feel like doing it and uh, uh, the catalysts aren't here. The Armadale Classic isn't the only event in the north to face the same fate this year, with other drafts also cancelled because of the drought. The draft usually attracts top name riders and while the club will attempt to stage a one-day event later in the year, it won't offer the same prize money. But it's not just the riders who'll miss out. Armadale Charities will also lose. They usually share the proceeds. We have already donated over $1,000 to the ACE appeal and intended to give the proceeds of the carnival to that appeal. We, we sincerely regret on their behalf uh, not being able to support them further, but uh, we hope to be able to do something later on in the year. The Tingara Centre was badly damaged by the recent bushfires. To ensure the repair work progresses quickly, the Hunter Golf Professionals today presented the centre with a cheque for $20,000. While the money will go towards repairing the main function room and the play area, it will also be used to establish an animal nursery on the grounds of the facility. And I think watching the development of little animals from a, from, from a tiny age is a wonderful education for the children. So we are actually going to establish an animal nursery and also repair a lot of the damage that was uh, done to the playground during the bushfire. Every year the Hunter Golf Professionals with the help of NIB hold a charity golf day. This year it was held at the Steelworks Club and supported by former Australian and Queensland Rugby League captain Wally Lewis. Fisheries officers on the Hunter River and at Port Stephens have hauled up more than 70 illegal crab traps over the past few weeks. Professional fishermen are allowed 10 to 20 traps, but inspectors believe some operators may be pulling up to 100 in a day. According to the department, the resource is being overfished, with the indiscriminate taking of undersized and egg-carrying females, especially among the popular blue swimmer crabs. We're here to do something about that. Uh, these traps were seized off professionals and amateur fishermen uh, for various reasons. The crabs carry their eggs under a tail flap, larger on the female than on the male, and it is now an offence to capture, sell or disturb immature or pregnant female crabs and lobsters. Fisheries operations on the waterways are targeting illegal trapping, catch sizes and bag limits. 
Certainly if people are deliberately showing contempt for fisheries law, we do something about it. But um, we like to give everyone a fair go. Uh, the law is there for a reason and, and most people understand that reason and they should do the right thing. Wyong Shire President Tony Sheridan says senior council staff began talks with the Victorian developers some 18 months ago. Councillor Sheridan says negotiations were kept quiet because the proposal hadn't gone to council yet and neither a development application or an environmental impact study has been lodged. It's believed word of the park was leaked to the media from the office of the Minister for State Development, Mr Yabsley, earlier this week. Councillor Sheridan can see no gain in this, except it being another political promise by the government in its bid to win last-minute votes in Saturday's by-election. Should the park become a reality, the proposed site owned by Pacific Power is near the Tugra railway station. While resembling America's Disneyland in style and quality, Councillor Sheridan says there'll be a strong Australiana theme. Councillor Sheridan admits to being excited by the concept, especially the employment prospects for the area. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. One hundred and forty guests as well as finalists attended the MBN Studio Come Restaurant for the 13th annual presentation to acknowledge the tremendous achievements of the athletes in the viewing area which stretches from the Hawkesbury River to the Tweed and out west to Moree. Jennifer Green set the tone of the evening. Three future stars won encouragement awards. War hopes Emma Everingham for her brilliant efforts in the swimming pool, Natasha Moore, an archer from Glen Innes who grabbed international honours, and Newcastle's Reagan Gilmore, a netballer with unlimited potential and a state team member at 17. One of the biggest cheers of the night was reserved for special award winner Joseph Walker, an intellectually disabled swimmer who spent last year smashing world records. In the MBN St George Sports Star of the Year, surfing was well represented through finalists. Swimming also had a couple of nominations, gliding, boxing, wave skiing, tennis, cycling, athletics, martial arts, golf and hockey. And it was the New South Wales Minister for Sport, Recreation and Racing, George Suris, who did the honours in announcing the winner. Fighters' performance of three medals at the Pan Pacific Championships and a sensational win over the world champion Matt Biondi in the US Open Championship sealed the award for Chris, who appeared live from the Nine Studios in Brisbane and was overwhelmed in winning the $9,000 prize. The night was an overwhelming success and again St George pledged their involvement for 1992. Double trouble in the stock cars to set the scene. Some over-exuberance early in the modified rods and drivers paid a heavy price. John Robbins taken to hospital after slamming into the concrete wall and Sydney sider Steve Hopping getting a different view of the track. More drama followed as defending champion Steve Robinson of Lismore blew his motor in a big way but a phone call for a new motor will see him in the final tonight with a big chance to retain his crown. 
Alan Harris must have nightmares about racing at Tomigo. Two weeks, two flips. Tonight's modified final will be some race. Conditions were much more friendly today than the wild surf of Yamba last weekend, which wreaked havoc with the carnival. The New South Wales country titles exclude Newcastle, Manly Warringah and Sydney clubs, but even clubs from those areas would have found today's competition pretty tough. Host club Cudgeon is the overnight leader on 39.5 points, and they have a handy lead of 13 points over second place Byron Bay, who are the favourites. Cudgeon were successful in the five-man rescue and resuscitation and were consistent in most other events. The girls' flags were won by G. Clark of the Woolgooga Club and M. Bill of Cudgeon was quicker than the rest in the boys. The carnival continues tomorrow. And away they went in the New South Wales point score rowing regatta on the Manning River at Taree in conditions conducive to good rowing. Perfect, terrific. We couldn't wish for any better. Uh, normally we have a great nor'easter blowing here, you know, a lot of chop and everything else, but today is absolutely perfect. Clubs from Sydney, the Hunter region and local boats numbering 60 in all battled out races in all divisions from skulls to fours and the prestigious eights. And for the organisers, the competition against the city slickers is a valuable asset, especially to the up and coming juniors within the clubs. Strength building is one of the most important roles pre-season it seems for rugby league players these days and the Knights have again astounded the coaching staff with their build up to the 1992 season. Of the 52 players tested today in the annual Battle of the Muscle Bulge, everyone achieved a personal best in one of three disciplines, bench press, power clean or chin ups. President's cover Robbie O'Davis won the overall club champion with an averaged point score of 6.99 with Brad Godden second and Paul Marquette third. Marquette bench pressed an amazing 330 pounds with his 93 kilo frame. Drama early in the intercity pace final, Dick Osborne and Shudo parting company. In the end, a one horse race is the favourite bolted in. Thirteen to eight on and favourite, fourteen to one and twenty-five to one. A great turnout for the running of the twenty-six Tom Johansson Memorial Athletics meeting at Katara South, with all age groups from under eight to veterans taking part in track as well as field events. And the most vocal of the lot, Tookley, as they sang the praises of their athletes. Amanda Cooper won the women's one hundred metres in a good time, while the main event, the one hundred and forty metre final of the Johansson Memorial, was a beauty. Terrigal's David James off 16 metres hanging on to win from Tookley's Daniel Lewis and young Belmont North sprinter Andrew Ford. A true test of surfing skills today in the annual Catherine Hill Bay Catho Classic. Not so much for the riding brilliance, but in the ability to pick the right wave out of the slop. Board riders from all along the coast battled through the heats and attempted to make the final. But in the wash-up, it was a junior who prevailed in the prestigious event once more. Matt Wells in the black singlet was the winner on a countback from Kev Slattery in red. A great tussle for the other placings in the six-man final. Daniel Frodsham finishing third, just in front of Justin Lee, Andy Brinkworth and Lee Dean. The contest is a valuable event as it gives surfers the opportunity to compete without the professionals in the event. <laughs>